Hi, I'm the Reverend John Romig, Senior Pastor here at the Gender Road Christian Church, and I'm really glad that you could join us today. I encourage you to get out your Bible and follow along as you hear the Word. We have a lot to cover today, so let's get started, and I know that God will bless you as you hear today's message. We welcome Reverend Don Eskew this morning to bring God's Word to us. If you want to come up here and... Uh, he is a retired pastor, and you might want to tell them a little bit about yourself, but uh, we have so much fun with him, and everybody loves him so much, and we are uh, filled with joy to have you here this morning. Thank you, Don. Be careful about everybody. You know, I'm not sure everybody loves me, but I think some. So. <laughs> well, to start this sermon out, I want to thank Kay and John and Karen and for asking me back to be in the pulpit. Uh, I thought they'd given up on me, and, uh, but uh, I hadn't. And so I'm back and uh, I appreciate their support. Uh, this is a, a first sermon for a couple of things. This is my first sermon for those of you who don't know, know me. Since my wife has passed away, she was always in the audience, always very attentive, and always had a little critique for the sermon. And uh, we never had fried preacher at, at uh, the dinner table, but we did discuss the preacher, me. So, but I miss her, and I loved her dearly, and we were married for 58 years, and uh, this, is one of the, this is the first sermon without her. I do have on her elder's pen that was given her at Branson Christian Church in Branson, Missouri, to remember her and to make sure that she is with me now at this time. But this is also a first. Uh, life moves forward and changes happen. And I have a son who will be in the second service, and he is 55 years old, and the reason that we are here, my wife and I are here, is that he ended up with a job at Otterbine. And at this moment, he is chair of the business department in Otterbein, at Otterbein University, has his doctorate in human resources from OSU. Uh, his, he drove his grandfather almost a distraction because he went to school for so long and he kept, uh, grandfather kept asking his daughter, my wife, when is Don going to get a regular job? And she'd say, he has a job. But anyway, he is uh, why we're here. And today I'm, going, I'm announcing that he will be getting married September 6th at High Banks. And he and his wife will be going to the OSU football game afterwards. And I'm going to be regulated to some small chamber away, you know, for that. There will also be a, a, not a wonderful daughter, Haley, involved who will be coming to Lewis Center. And so we thank the church. I thank the church. Donna, uh, Don Ed thanks the church for your support during this time of transition. Uh, you felt your love and support. Now, to tell you about myself, I'm a, obviously a retired minister. People 81 years old walk funny, you know. And they, and not, you don't want to walk that way, but that's the way you walk. And so uh, as you get older, you will discover that. And uh, the mind also, I think about things, you know, and uh, this sermon, uh, you're an experiment. Uh, you know, uh, I, you will... I've thought about this sermon. I didn't intend to preach this sermon, but as I got into it, this is how it's going to come out. I, for to know what I, a little bit about me and my, how I came to the Christian life, uh, I started out as a farmer in southwest Iowa. Instead of uh, uh, going to the ballpark, my father bought me a tractor and sent me to the field. And I spent many hours cultivating corn and all that kind of stuff. And so thinking I would find a better way of life, and I was raised in kind of a dysfunctional family, lots of secrets in the family, which we're still discovering to this very day. But uh, be that as it may, I joined the Navy, not as a minister. 
uh, I was just walked in and said, I want to join up, and they took me. Uh, they wanted a warm body is what they wanted. Uh, I'm convinced. They, they checked my blood pressure, and uh, they thought, uh, finally, they had to lay me down for half an hour, and when the blood pressure went away, they said, you're in. So <laughs> they wanted a warm body. They were desperate. But anyway, the Navy was good for me because I discovered how to get along with people. I discovered the world out there. I ended up on Guam twice, 18 months at a time, and uh, was in construction work. I was not in the ministry. My first job in the Navy was to help build a beer hall. That's the absolute truth. And I had one parishioner in Branson, Missouri that had been there. So we had something to relate to. So uh, I've also worked in the oil fields. I've worked uh, plowing uh, Oklahoma uh, wheat land. I've done all kinds of things to make a living. I uh, have uh, piloted a, a cement truck, and the wife of the man who owned it was always after me because I was supposed to clean up the cement truck. And uh, she said, you're, not dr you're driving a dirty truck. And so that was my introduction into the cement business. I, by the way, I never did wash the truck. I always finagled the way out of that. But uh, there were reasons for that. But that's the story of the background of my life. And so as we experiment together in this sermon today, I want to talk to you a little bit about... Uh, the sermon title and uh, things, the reason that I chose it. The scripture comes from uh, 1 Peter, the third chapter, verses 8 through 12. Finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another. I guess that takes me in. I, I'm included there. Uh, finally got in. Uh, a tender heart and a humble mind do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse. But on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is for this that you were called, that you might inherit a blessing. For those who desire life, all of us gathered here desire life. That's why we're here. We're seeking, we're seeking to move forward. Let them keep their tongues from evil and their lips from speaking deceit. Let them turn away from evil and do good. Let them seek peace and pursue it. We're going to talk later on about translation of the Bible. Another translation, the Living Bible says, let us seek peace and run after it. Seek it out. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. There is a, I read the cartoons also. I read the editorials. I read everything I can get my hands on. I read religious things. I read politicians. I read uh, philosophy. Whatever I can read, I read and enjoy it. And so in the cartoon of the family circus, there, uh, one of the little girls, it's a, you know, the family circus is about a family. And the little girl is speaking her piece to the family. And she says, which way am I supposed to face when looking forward? Now think about that. Which way do you look when you're looking forward? Which way is it? Well, we're going to think about that a little bit as well as a compass in our life. And I'd like for us to think about that for a moment. Uh, someone also said in a piece, the uh, rabbi said one day to his students, you have to discover when night turns into day. And so he said, give me illustrations. Well, one student said, when you can see someone coming down the road. No, that wasn't it. Another student says, when you can see the trees. No, that wasn't it. Another one said, when you can see the garden and see what's going on. No, that wasn't it. Another one said, when you can see the animals. No, that wasn't it. Finally, the students said, 
How do you know when night is turning into day? Now remember, I've just read to you, which way am I supposed to face when looking forward? When night turns into day, the rabbi said, look on the face of any man or woman, and when you see that she or he are your brother or your sister, that is the beginning of day. If you can't see that, it's still dark for you. Still dark. Which way am I supposed to face when I'm looking forward? Definitely face my brothers, my sisters, and recognize them. That's one thing. If you have Christ as your compass, and by the way, uh, I hope all of you have your cell phones. Do you, how many have your cell, iPhones and cell phones here today with you? How many? Take them out. You have, a, you have an iPhone? Who has iPhones? Who's got an iPhone? You're not supposed to turn your phone on in church. See, I told you you were an experiment. So. <laughs> but take your phone out, punch the button, and run up the compass. It's the compass I want you to see. There's the compass. Everybody, get, if you can't see the compass, slide up to somebody or something. Notice the compass. It keeps changing. If you move around, it changes. You can't, it does, it's not just your north, west, south. It's changing all the time. This is about compass of being connected. If you're going to be in the Christian life, you have to recognize that God is calling you to recognize your brother and sister, to figure out which way you're looking is forward. And as you move around and as you live your life, the compass of your life, the Christian life is going to change. I never thought that I was going to be a minister. I was violently against it. My mother was an authoritarian Christian and she kept her authority. My father, I'm not sure what he was. And they had dark secrets. When I joined the Navy, I was struggling. Am I going to be a Christian? I thought it was for sissies. I hadn't seen but one or two men. There was a banker, but he had lots of money. He could afford to be a Christian. Uh, he taught my Sunday school class when I was in the first and second grade. That's the only man I'd had contact with until after I was 18 years old that was a Christian. So when I joined the Navy, they weren't all Christians, obviously not. Not many of them when I first got there. One of the few things I liked about the Navy in boot camp was that when we went, when we went to chapel, <laughs> and at that time, we were forced to go to chapel. You don't do that today. But we were forced to. Thousands of men singing religious songs. One of the most moving things I had heard in my whole life. And it was in the Navy. I didn't find a home. I, I can't say that, that I was at home in the Navy, but I enjoyed my time of being around. Then I kept running on to Christian men. Men who really knew what the Christian life was all about. Now, I ended up in construction work. We Christians decided to carry our Bibles. I'd been cussed out more than once for carrying my Bible up the street of a, construct, of a row of construction workers who were about half drunk. It wasn't pleasant but it forces you to think about the compass in your life. Which way am I facing? What am I going to do? How am I going to live my life? And of course, I saw the whole spectrum of the problems of life and recognized that probably I didn't want to go that way. And so I decided that I was going to be a Christian. I stood on the ship one time as we were going overseas. They had, on this uh, troop ship, you could go up on the bridge, not where they steered the ship, but you could go up to the bridge beside it and you look out over the ocean. I argued with God for four days. 
I can be a wonderful layman. Think of all the money I can give to the church. Just think about what's going to happen. But there was one problem, one small problem. In my dysfunctional family, as an elementary student, I had read the Bible through two or three times. Now, I wasn't a great Bible scholar because remember I said my mother was an authoritarian Christian. I was a seeking Christian. I didn't have all the answers. But the DNA of those scriptures stuck in my heart. And I kept hearing the message, won't you go be a minister? And I kept saying no. In fact, I was something like the one who ran off and was swallowed by the whale because I didn't want to be a preacher. I didn't want to face up to it. But in the Navy, I kept running into these Christian guys. They kept challenging me. They kept speaking to me. They kept living Christian lives in the midst of all that was going on around us. And I saw some wild things, wild things. We were overseas in construction work. Finally, but the ma one of the wonderful things about all this, as I struggled with it, Donna had started to write to me. And she kept writing and writing and writing. And we kept writing back and forth. And I went home once, and we got engaged. And then I left for another year and a half. But she kept writing. And so, but she still thought I was going to be a farmer. And so one day I hesitantly sent her a letter and I said, I've decided to become a minister. What do you think? And she wrote back the neatest letter. And she said, you know, I've always wanted to be a minister's wife. In fact, when my father and mother go to Bialk when I was a little kid, we used to go to church. And I would take my dolls and play communion. And she said, I would love to be a minister's wife. And she was a fantastic minister's wife. I have to tell you something about her. Uh, as she was little, she contacted scarlet fever, and it went to her eyes. And it was very serious, and they almost thought she was going to die. But she lost the sight partially in this one eye. I loved her for it. A lot of people thought that they just didn't like the way she looked. But I loved her, and we just had a great time together. But anyway, we would be in church and I'd be preaching, and I'd be walking out the door, and she'd come up and say, you know, you better check out so-and-so. And I'd say, why? And she said, well, out of this bad eye, I could see something going on. <laughs> Nobody knew that she could see out of that eye just enough to, uh, we were able to help many people because she could see out of that bad eye, and no one realized it. What a witness as she was and what a challenge she was to my life. Now, if you have Christ as a compass, you can look forward. Forward to a, a, not, a, not a great, wonderful life. I'm not promising you all tea and travel and all that. Sometimes we're in the place we are, and sometimes we have to deal with what's happening, and sometimes we have health problems, and sometimes life just gets crazy. Talking about the language of the street, one of the things that my son happened to me was that Donna would give him money to put in the offering plate, and uh, you talk about the language of the street, and he would come home and, you know, the money would be in the offering plate, and Donna would check, and everything was fine. And then one day he came home, and he had the same amount of change that he had taken to church. And she said, you've got the same amount of change. Well, we taught him to be honest, and he said, uh, well, Mama, I put in the offering. Well, something sidetracked us, you know. If, if he's put in the offering, even though he had some money, we didn't check at that time. But two Sundays later, she checked him again, and he had more money than he had taken to church. Now, if you're a minister and his wife, you're horrified. The kid's stealing money out of the offering plate. Who knows what he's doing? Morally, he's going wrong. He's running around with the deacon's kids. He's doing all kinds of things. You know, 
and, but she pinned him down. And he said, Mom, I put the body in the offering plate. But he said, there's this parishioner, this member. He keeps paying me 25 cents, 50 cents. And he said, tell your dad to keep the sermon short. And he's, he was paying him. And so obviously, I had, you know, in my moral observation, I had to do something about that. I was the minister. You know, we, you know I, I didn't realize about the language of the street. I had read the Bible. You couldn't morally subsidize the kids in church. You had, you had to work for their money. So Monday morning, I brought myself up to my whole five foot seven inches and at that time, I weighed a whole hundred pounds when what I had on my shoes. And so I had six blocks to go. And so I started to walk this six blocks righteously, you know, huffing and puffing, and I'm going to straighten this out, and we'll speak about the ministry, and we'll talk about God and all this stuff. And now the four blocks, it was six blocks away, the four blocks went fine. I was morally correct, and everything was great. But then the man who was involved was gardening and he looked up from his hoe and saw me coming, huffing and puffing religiously. He started to laugh. I started to laugh. The last two blocks religiously disintegrated. And by the time we got together, we were in hilarious laughter. I mean hilarious laughter. And we, he decided to quit paying off, and I decided to keep preaching. But le, how good that was to have that relationship down on the street, because later on, we saw problems in that community a lot more serious than if you're paying some little boy to keep the sermon short. They listen to the sermon when it comes to the language of the street. When the language is where you can hear it, speak it, enjoy it, this is what you have to speak. And it gets, it gets down on the street. Now, we saw the song, Holy, 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 and I understand that, and I'm not talking against it. But I'm talking about the Scriptures reaching into every one of your lives where you are. Not necessarily, well, I hope it reaches you at the church. Absolutely, we all do. But when you walk out of here, the language of the Scripture on the street will go with you, and it will be about your life, what you're doing. Are you walking? Are you facing in the right direction? Are you going the right way? Now, you're going to become a part of an experiment. I am fascinated, in a sense, with all the technology, how I wish that in my ministry that I would have had it. We were just beginning to have computers. I never had a cell phone. I can't tell you how many times I went to a phone to call somebody, or I, we had codes we could call home, and you could check it out. And even one of the parishioners did not like for the phone to have an answering service. She would call and she'd say, Little phone, you tell your daddy that I need him. <laughs> and so yeah, that was our technology. But today, this wonderful, fascinating technology that is going to take us to great heights, I think. What will it do for the church? What will your cell phone do for the church? How will the language of the street speak to your cell phone, to you and to all those around you? In one of the statistics that I read, it says that normally on Facebook, you have 300 and some friends. That's fine. I'm not against it. There are some churches that do not have 330 members. What a ministry. What a ministry to speak out and to take on people's lives. If I had my choice today, we would have not preached this sermon. I would have had a moment to sit down with each one of you 
every one of you, young, middle-aged, whatever your age you are, and find out all there is to know about your life. This is the part I loved about the pastoral ministry. I met such fascinating people, good people, wonderful people, loving people. Oh, they were some, sure. They were some in the Navy. I got used to them all. But when you meet those fascinating people, you hang on. You face in that direction because those people, you can grow with them and they can grow with you. And I'm sorry, Kay is, is retiring, but she's been a fascinating person, I'm sure, into her retirement. She's going to take all the wonderful love and uh, all your wonderful lives with you. That is her retirement, let me tell you, is how wonderful the Christian life has been. And it will be that for you also. Now, about, about the cell phone. Uh, words are in retreat. This is in the dispatch, May the 22nd. Words are in retreat, it says. Areas such as history, literature, religion, and arts are receding. It says, and I, I love this because I read every day. I read the paper. I read every book I can get a hold of. I read all kinds of magazines, all kinds of thoughts. And as I read this, I really came up short. It said, after a, a study of 2 billion web visits, they found that 55% of the readers spent fewer, fewer than 15 seconds on a page. If you want to discover the Christian life, if you want to be spiritual in your solitude, if you want in meditation to reap the spiritual insights that can come from reading, it has to be longer than 15 seconds a page. That's the downside. But there's an upside. One of those who took all this survey said, and he said, statistics are becoming the thing. Everything has to be backed by scientific evidence. But then he says at the end, this historian, this scientist, as a scientist, I can say that very little is measurable. Very little is measurable. And so, my friends, there's tremendous hope for those who are using this technology. I don't want to be a part of the church that was like the church of the, just before the Renaissance when they said that the world was not round, it was flat, and that the sun, you, we revolved, the sun didn't, we didn't revolve around the sun and all this stuff. We cannot and must not and must never be a part of the church that holds back on technology that can further the Christian life. So with that in mind, remember that a compass is that which connects us. It keeps us going in the right direction. It's that which makes us realize that we're going to be somebody different than what we started out to be. Who wouldn't be different if you live by this? Finally, all of you have unity of spirit. How much unity do we see? We struggle for the unity. We struggle for unity in our marriages. I would go and, and they'd say, well, how long have you been married? Well, we've been married 50 years. They'd just shake their head. They did not understand the unity that went together. Sure, we had our struggles. Sure, we had our differences of opinion. Donna was a person to stand up for her own right, and I never walked on Donna, never, ever, ever. But let me tell you, we, it, caused, it had great cause for unity. And so as we come together, I think that we want to think about being Christians as really great in life, using what we have. A music teacher who was known for her great students, when she'd get ready for a recital, 
would always have them practice the ending notes. They practice the middle and the beginning, but always the ending. And they'd practice the ending and practice the ending and practice the ending. And finally, some of them begin to grumble. And they said, how come we're always practicing the, the ending? Why, why can't we practice the rest of the song? And she said, I want to tell you, you can make a mistake in your recital at the beginning. You can make a mistake in the middle. But you must not make a mistake in the end to have a grandiose ending for people to remember you and so our Christian life comes to that. It comes to saying, which way are you facing? Know which way you're facing. Make sure your compass is right, not only in your cell phone, but in your heart. And make sure that you get ready to meet the Lord whenever he calls you on his terms. Thank you for having me. May you walk forth in the language of the street with God by your side. May we pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, be with us this day. Guide and strengthen. Watch over us in a mighty way. Speak to us of spiritual things and always be with us. And we give thanks for a life that you've given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. In thy name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Often as people hear the message, they have questions about what they've heard or they feel of God's Holy Spirit working on their heart. I encourage you to contact me so we can discuss that and help you and encourage you on your faith journey.